Okay, in terms of the stuff, the deadlines are on change of file. So, exam two, quizzes part three, deadline April 5th, at end of day. Exam three, exam four, quizzes part four, deadline uh, April 26th, end of day. And exam five, the final, covering all the stuff, deadlines at the end of the normal final time. And uh, once, you get, once you've done exams one through four, the paper, bless you, all the quizzes you wish to do, then you can see if you need the final one or not. Because the way it's set up is anything you haven't done is already pre-zeroed, and so it doesn't have to be done graded because it's already auto-zeroed. And then we'll be able to see if you need the final or not. And I'll say more of this in the future. Paper draft deadline April 4th, plus five deadline April 9th, emergency deadline April 16th, desperation deadline April 26th, upcoming meetings next week, uh, from on um, Tuesday, 3 12 24, 2019, from 2 to 5. Doesn't impact the class, but if you look for me during office hours, then I will be there. I'll be at exciting meetings. Before pressing on to our new old stuff, anything about our previous stuff stuff yes, that needs more. Question. So it's about the, the paper. Uh -huh. um, just, just so I can kind of make sure I understand what it's like any topic that we've covered in, the, in this class, right? Right? Yep, anything in, anything in epistemology. Okay, so I had one page. Okay. I wanted to know if I would be able to um, do a topic that was our, our do our dreams like um, emulate reality or our, are our dreams reality and use some of the things that we've studied. Would that be able to like um, or like, do you know of how I should go about that to make it fall under the category of epistemology? Um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that can happen there. So it, it depends on, uh, do you want to say that dreams are, are real? Right. Yeah, because you could, you could argue that um, they are real, and then argue like how we, how we know that. And there, are, there is some interesting. Um, I was I just happened to read about this. There's a, a sci-fi story by Ursula K. Le Guin, and it was the story is the, the word for world is forest, and it talks about um, like a human um, offshoot where their dreams they can dream like their dreams are considered like real by them, and she said she based it on a, a real a human tribe that had the view that. Dreaming was like, not the only world, but a real world. And so there, I'll, I'll, I have that in my book, so I'll look up a reference for that. If you email me, I'll send you the reference. There's also, I think in uh, Australian, uh, their view of metaphysics, there's like the idea of the dream time. And in many human cultures, there's the idea of the dream world is real. Not the same as like this world, but it's not like, in the West, we generally think of dreams as not real, but it's things going off in mind, and so there is the, the view that dreams are actually expressing a reality, if not like a separate, you know, realm, uh, but, uh, but perhaps, you know, doing something real right. or meaningful. Yeah, so that could be a good thing. The main thing would be kind of like getting it, you know, focused and then kind of supporting you know, your position. But yeah, there's some interesting stuff there. And yeah, coincidentally, I just happened to be reading about a story about, about that. Okay, anything else? Okay, so last time looking at our good dead friend, Dr. Wilhelm Leibniz, talking about necessity and contingency. And we saw that he divines truths up into truths of reason and truths of fact. And so kind of the eternal battle is between what kind of things can you know just by thinking about it, and what stuff can you only know by going and looking and, and seeing. And Leibniz sort of uh, presents what becomes the standard distinction. Truths of reasoning have the quality of being necessary, and truths of fact are contingent. So in one way you could say we can always know truths of reasoning if they're necessary, because they're always true. You don't have to go, and we don't have to go and look, because no matter where you are, they're, they're, they're always true. Whereas truths of fact, it would depend on where you and to use like a sci-fi example, it'd be kind of like if you had like a dimensional, you know, 
travel ship or like a gateway. Uh, and someone said, well, will, there be, will triangles have three sides in another dimension? And the answer would always be, yeah, they always, they always have three sides. You know, we don't pretend like a triangle probe. Then the question might be, uh, is there air? <laughs> we don't know. So you want to go and, as they said in the galaxy quest, you want to check before you go, you go over there. Because that triangle is on three sides, the idea is that's true everywhere, you don't have to look. But whether there's a breathable, breathable atmosphere or not, that would be something you need to check. Because maybe it's got to, maybe it doesn't. Now in terms of the foundation or truths of reason, he claims there's two fundamental principles for this. And these are fundamental principles of logic. The principle of contradiction and the principle of identity. So what are these? Well, the principle of contradiction is this. If a proposition is self-contradictory, then its negation must be true. With some, give a simple example. The most basic contradiction is, of course, P and not P. Because the conjunction in logic is true when both parts are true, false otherwise. So free logic. So this is always going to be, this can never be true. It'd be like saying today is Thursday and today is not Thursday. Now, there are things that people may think, well, can it be true that it's raining and not raining? Well, yeah, it could be raining here and not someplace else, but it can't be raining and not raining in like an exact, exact place. So if you negate, you know, a contradiction, then it's always going to be true. Because if it's always false, to deny it would always be true. So if, if I say it's not raining and not raining, I'm always right. Now, today, you know, we call this, of course, a contradiction. And if you take like one of the logic class, contradictions are false in virtue of the logical structure. So you just you wouldn't have to go and check. You just you work out a truth table, and it would always come out. You know, this is always false. The negation is always true. Second principle, and this comes from our good dead friend Aristotle, is the principle of identity, which is P is P, or as Aristotle said, A is A. For each thing is what it is. You are what you are. Donald Trump is what he is, and you're not Donald Trump. Donald Trump's not here. <laughs> Probably everyone's happy about, about that scenario. Now, he claims that those are the foundations of these necessary truths. Everything else is built on that. So an identical proposition for him would be this. It's the truth of reason such that if you deny it, that would create a contradiction. Now, it's easy to come up with an example of this the power of logic. So this, P or not P, is a, well, it's what's called tautology. Tautologies are statements that are always true because of their structure. You don't have to go and, and look. You just, you know, if you do the truth table for it, you know they're true. Because of the disjunction in logic, it's it's true when one or both are true. And so with this assumption of uh, you know, any, any statement is either true or false or not both, either P is true or not P is true. Because if P is true, not P is false. But if P is false, not P is true. So one is going to be true. So always true. And of course, if you negate this, it, it's always false. So identical proposition is to deny it creates a contradiction. A more, well, some more substantial one would be saying that, uh, you know, denying that a bachelor is unmarried. I mean, you, can, you can deny like Sam is unmarried, like he's lying to people. But to say that the bachelor, I deny the bachelor is unmarried, that would be you know, a contradiction. Because it'd be saying, I deny that the unmarried person is unmarried. Or like a triangle. If someone says that deny that the three-sided figure is three-sided, I mean, they can say the words, but it would be impossible. So far, probably so good. Because again, this is all just you know, 
basic logic stuff. Reason and proof. So, so far we got the truths of reason, and no matter where you go, supposedly they're always true. Now, there is an interesting debate in metaphysics about could there be worlds where these don't hold, where the principle of, uh, non principle of contradiction, the principle of entity don't hold, where each thing need not be what it is. And of course, we, in a way, be kind of inconceivable, but you could argue that we're just trapped in our own view of things. It's kind of like if someone's uh, super sexist. They couldn't imagine like a woman being confident in something. So it's not that a woman can't be confident, it's just they just can't imagine it. So maybe we just can't imagine this, but it could, could be. But it's unclear how that would work. So kind of the assumption is, is that no matter how many worlds there are, this would always hold. So if you had your handy dandy dimensional transport machine or gateway, no matter where you went, these would always, always hold, supposedly. So what about our truths of fact? Well, Bonnet's claims that all truths of reason, you can distill, analyze them down to identical propositions. So the claim would be is that if something, something is a necessary truth, it eventually would come down to you know, either the principle of contradiction or the principle of identity. And so you'd always be able to work it down there and say, aha, that's why it's always true. Now he says in the case of a truth of fact, that you can't do this. That no matter how much you like distilled it or boiled it down, you wouldn't end up with a contradiction or principle of identity. And we can take any, any truth of fact. For example, if we take Donald Trump as president, if we deny that Donald Trump is not president, it would, it would be not true now. But you can imagine um, someone was like in a, in a coma and you know, for like five years and they don't know what it is, they wouldn't be able to tell by laying there in bed whether Trump is president or not. Because saying Donald Trump is not president, it's not true now, but it's not a contradiction. Because it's not that if you analyze Trump, that he is president you know, forever. Eventually time runs out. And so it doesn't come down to identity. So we don't get you know Trump equals president. We just get Trump happens to be president now. And we can deny it. You know, Trump is not president. We can deny that without a contradiction. Because you know, all, for all we know, the Mueller report came in and he's just been led away. You know, sorry, he's, he's arrested. He's done. So then, what makes these truths true? Now, Leibniz believed that if you get something that's true, there's going to be a reason why it's true. In the case of truths of necessity, truths of reason, principle of contradiction, principle of identity. So what about truths of fact? Like what makes the claim true that Trump is president? Well, Leibniz has this thing he calls the principle of sufficient reason. And interestingly, his statement of it is less famous than the parody version of this. Because there's a fellow named Voltaire, who's also really dead, he wrote a novel called Candide, in which he goes after Leibniz. Because uh, Leibniz said, uh, this is the best of all possible worlds, and Leibniz, the principle of sufficient reason, and the character of um, Pangloss, I believe, is the kind of the parody of Leibniz. So it's kind of funny that the parody, in many ways, is more famous than the, the original. <laughs> It'd be kind of like if the, you know, in the future, everyone knew about uh, the Baldwin's parodies of Trump, but said, oh, he was really a president? Oh my god. They had no idea, no idea of that. So what is the principle of sufficient reason? Well, that's what he claims. No fact can be real or existent, no statement true, unless there be a sufficient reason why it is so and not otherwise. So his claim is, is that any contingent truth, like Trump is president, or the Patriots won the Super Bowl, or the Patriots owner possibly going to jail um, because of Florida. So people ask me, like, what's wrong with Florida? I'm like, I just live here. I'm not, I'm not responsible yet. 
I don't know, at what, what point do you become responsible for Florida if you lived here long enough? He'd be a part of the crime. <laughs> so his view is you can always, there has to be like a reason why. Like with a contradiction, the answer is just immediately there. Why is it not true? A contradiction. Why is that true? A tautology. But with something like Trump being president, you can always, you can ask why, and it'd be an answer. Now, he does know that we may not know, because he distinguishes between there being a reason and us knowing a reason. There's a lot of stuff where we wouldn't, we wouldn't know. Because he claims we can know it's true without understanding all the reasons behind it. Like, we know we're here, but we don't know for sure why. We don't have a complete picture of this. God, fortunately, can understand this. So his picture is, if you have something like, you know, Trump being president, then of course you can ask, you know, is there be a reason why that's true? And you say, you know, electoral college. Um, then you have an explanation like, why electoral college, which takes us off like on one chain back, back to the fact that the founding fathers didn't trust democracy. Um, and then you have a question of like, there'd also be the question of like, why he got, you know, the votes he did, why he were lost. And so you have, you have this really complex you know, chain of explanations. Now, Bartlett actually uses this to argue that God not only exists, but that God must exist. And the reason why is, essentially, uh, very quickly, his claim is anything that's a contingent truth, so Trump is president, but we can imagine you know, a scenario where he didn't get to be president. For example, that um, the director of the FBI, FBI didn't make that announcement on Hillary's emails, that the story of uh, Donald Trump and the porn star uh, appeared on Fox News. That, actually, Fox found out about it before the election, but they killed the, killed the story, apparently. If that had gotten out, maybe in that world, Hillary would be president. So you need reasons as to why Trump is the president. And then, of course, you need a reason for that reason, a reason for that reason. And then, if everything needs a reason, this would be one of those infinite regresses. You, know, you can always just keep asking why. So Leibniz says, you need to get to something where there's no longer any why. It, just, it must be and can't be any different. And his solution is God. So I'll for him, why is everything the way it is, the ultimate answer is God. So why did Trump win the election? God. Because for for Leibniz, ultimately that's the answer. The, the, the chain ends. You know, you get, you get back to like, you know, first event, and then God. I guess this would be like creation, you know, God. So yeah, you, you eventually try to trace Trump back all the way to the creation. You believe that. And then, of course, it's gone behind that. And this creates a problem with Leibniz because then God is responsible for everything good, like waffles and kittens and rainbows, but also everything terrible. <laughs> so, problem of evil. But he does have a solution for that. And if you take the class of metaphysics, you'll see his attempt to solve the problem of evil. And then, spoiler, involves possible realities. And this is the best world there could be. So he believes that anything that's true either is true, you know, purely because of logic, or is true because God. There's a reason why. Now with these truths, we have to go and like look. You know, you have to you have to check. You can't just sit down and know. God, of course, knows it all, but we we don't. So the truths of reason are based on logical laws, must be true, and they'd be true everywhere. So again, you know, going to sci-fi, any world, if you had your dimensional travel ship, any world you set sail to, the laws of logic would always work, supposedly. But the truths of fact could, could change. Again, going to the very practical thing, 
you would know their triangles would always have three sides, but you wouldn't know if the air was breathable where you're going or whether the food was, was poisonous. You have to, have to check. Truths of fact are about what exists and what doesn't. Now, one of the interesting battles in philosophy that gets into pop culture is the whole free will determinism view. And here's kind of the, the distinction. Uh, determinism, there's a, there's a lot of varieties. Uh, the general view of determinism is, is that there's no free will. Everything happens in kind of a mechanical way. There's also what's called predeterminism, where everything is already preset. to use an analogy. It's like a, um, it's like a script to, to a movie where you couldn't, you know, you couldn't deviate from it. Or it's like, um, think of like a programmed um, you know, assembly robot. It just has its instructions. It's, it just does that. It just, it just follows that. Or the, the even simpler example would be like you set an alarm on your phone. That's, it's predetermined to, to go off at that time. There's also predestination, which is that, and that, that is a religious context, which is generally the idea that you're already pre-damned or pre-saved. And there's some verses of Christianity that, that have that option. So everything is already set, including your ultimate fate. Now, the opposing view to determinism is the idea, well, there's two kind of opposing views. One is chance. There is a random universe. So strict determinism, it's like, uh, probably the best metaphor is like the domino world, where you push the first domino and they all you know, fall. Or like those really complicated, you know, kind of cool machines where they do all that, that stuff. And with determinism, everything always, you know, does what it does, but work, it works. So chain of dominoes where they're all always, always gonna fall. Chance would be like the way we think of like dice, where it'd be random. So maybe the domino falls, maybe it falls the other way, it's random. And then the third option is choice, where there are actual decisions. And you can think of this as kind of like the, um, you know, the menu option, like in a, you know, in a program, like you're picking, or going to Netflix and picking your choices. The idea being that you, you can freely somehow select it. So kind of the debate about the nature of the universe, broadly speaking, is between these camps. Is everything fixed? So you, there is no chance, there's no randomness, there is no choice. Is it a random universe, or does it at least contain some random parts, you know, dice? And is there choice? Now choice and chance, of course, are separate. People often think, you know, well, if, if there's chance, like a quantum, you know, quantum indeterminacy that we have choice, but no, because with the fuse and an example, if something is determined, it's just, think of like your alarm. It just goes off at whatever you set it to. It doesn't have any choice. It's also not random. It doesn't go off with both of the random. Chance would be if you have, uh, well, a die would be a good example. You roll, you roll the dice, and, and it could be any of the numbers. But the die is not free. It's not, not choosing. And it would be like having, um, well, it's like in you know, games. Uh, like if, if you really were moved by the dice, like in you know, Monopoly, you take the steps, you don't pick your move, the dice pick your move. Choice would be that you choose. It's not random, it's not determined, somehow you're able to, to choose it. And this is super mysterious. No one has any idea how this works. Hi, this is Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> so this also applies to like the whole world. So one question that comes up in metaphysics is the question of the world we live in does it have to be the way that it is. Not like in the general sense, like do we have to have Trump president or do we have to have you know injustice, etc. But is all the world, could it be like different? Could things have been different? Either by chance or by choice. Now, one of the main ways to look at this involved God. 
So people like Leibniz and others, one of their questions was, when God makes the world, is he free to make anything? You know, or does he have to make it a certain way? Now what Leibniz says is that God can only make the world one way. And the reason is this. It goes back to the problem of evil. God is all good, so he'll make, he wants to make the best world, because he's good. He's all knowing, so he knows the best world. And he's all powerful, so he can make the best world. So being, since he's all good, all knowing, and all powerful, there's only one world he can make, which is the very best. Which is where we get the phrase, the best of all possible worlds. So to use a, a gaming analogy, it's like, um, if you ever play games where you can like pick your character or like an icon, God's like, he doesn't need to go to YouTube and you know, have all the league game of selling which is best because he's gone. He just immediately scrolls to the best and you know, selects that. So you can imagine he's got an infinite number of worlds scrolling across to his God box one, and he, he knows the best one. And of course, being all good, he wants it. Being all knowing, he knows it, what it is. And being all powerful, he makes it so. Now, Leibniz doesn't claim that this, everything that happens is the best you can imagine, because that would be stupid to claim. So for example, if you get like um, a parking ticket, or you get, you know, you get like a, a flu, you wouldn't say, wow, this flu is you know, great, I'm really glad I got the flu. Leibniz says, yeah, but if in a world where you didn't get the flu, it would be a worse world, something else would, would go, go wrong. Maybe like, in a world where you didn't get the flu, you were out, you were run over by a truck. But OK, flu better than, than truck death. And so his claim is that not everything is as best as we can imagine, but the whole world, taken in total, is as good as it could, could be. Because anything else, anything changed, would make the world worse, somehow. And so the idea is, is that God couldn't do otherwise because of this. But he does this, but the idea being is that God even though you know, being all good, powerful, all knowing, he would do this, and he, couldn't, and he wouldn't pick a worse world. On one hand, he wants to say that God is free to do this. He could have been like a jerk and like, hey, I'm gonna make a, make a worse world, enjoy the seconds. Uh, but then other times he says that because God has to make his best world. So he ends up kind of a you know, bit of a problem, because God being all good, powerful, all knowing means he's gonna make the best world, but he could have done otherwise. But of course he wouldn't, because he's not, not a jerk. Now there's also a problem of the question of, you know, are there really contingent truths, truths of fact? And Leibniz kind of muddles this too, or murkies it, which is this way. He makes the division by saying, you know, truths of reason means you got the subject, and then somehow the subject contains the predicate. You know, and again, the metaphor is terrible, as people point it out. But we kind of get, you know, okay, bachelor by definition is unmarried man. So we can kind of say, yeah, I guess it kind of contains that. But then Leibniz says this. Every true affirmative proposition, whether necessary or contingent, universal or particular, the notion of the predicate is some way contained in the subject. So this would seem to make, if you're serious about this, every claim an analytic claim. That you would be able to, if you understood the subject completely, you would know all the, all the predicates. Now, in the case of trying to look at three sides, we're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So, what does this mean? Well, going back to the kind of the whole freedom, choice, chance thing, we can look at it in terms of the most important person in the world, let's say ourselves. And one thing we wonder about is, as we go through life, could things have been different? Could you have made different choices? So if you, if you think, you know, your life's going great, uh, you may, as a cautionary tale, think, oh, I could have you know, made some bad decisions, ended up like someone else. 
or things that are going so great, you might say, well, things are going so great now, but I can make better, I can make it better tomorrow. Tomorrow. No. Also going along with this is the notion of what philosophers call personal identity. What is it that makes you you across time? No. Leibniz embraces what's called essentialism. And here's the idea. On this view, the individual, he, you, Donald Trump, each of us contains all of our properties, predicates, in such a way that if they were changed, we would not be us. You would be you, I would be me. So for example, here would be like Trump, and that would be the subject, you know, like subject predicate. And he would have all his properties, everything that he, you know, being president now, you know, being on the, the apprentice, etc., all the way back, all those properties. That would be all of Trump's properties. And if any of them changed, he wouldn't be Trump anymore. I mean, he may be called Trump, but it wouldn't be him anymore. Now, Aristotle had the view, he distinguished between what he called accidental properties, not meaning like once you get like an accident, like the like trip and fall or something, and essential properties. For him, the difference was this. Essential properties are ones that if they changed, you wouldn't be you anymore, or the thing wouldn't be the thing. So like with a simple example, like with a triangle, you take away the sides, not a triangle. Accidental properties are ones you could lose or think you lose and still be. Yeah. So, if this triangle, you know, if you colored it in, it's still a triangle, just a different color. Or if you erased it, the some of it, it would still be a triangle, just be a different color. Yes, accidental property. Yep. Yeah. yeah, ones you can lose, but so for example, with, with people, we would say like, um, you know, hair length, you know, would be, and you could, if you, know, you don't think that if you cut your hair, that you're not. Now, now, Leibniz doesn't think that if you cut your hair, you're not you, because what he would say would be, your property would be having a certain length of hair at a certain time. So, like if you get your hair cut tomorrow, then one of your properties would be, you get your hair cut, you know, you have your, your short hair then. So it wouldn't be that if something changed, it wouldn't be you, you would have all these properties in there, you know, pre-listed. Now, Leibniz believed that from the moment of your creation, belief in God, everything you ever would be, everything you would do, in a way is already in there. So, all that you are, literally everything you'll be, is already part of you. Like your, your history, is, to, use an, to use an analogy, it's sort of like, um, the DVD of your life, it's already, already there. And, and God, of course, sees the whole thing. Now we have to live it, you know, so like we're on, you know, play at one, you know, just normal play, but God, of course, sees the whole thing. So he comes up with this notion of what can be called like necessary contingency, or contingent necessity, which is this. These truths are contingent because they don't have to be true, but they're also necessary in the sense that, well, in the following way. If something exists, then it must be what it is. It can't be otherwise. Here's, uh, here's an analogy. Uh, you can think of it this way. Think of the world as like a game board, and God has a big box of pieces. Or you can think of it like a video game, like League of, Le of Legends or Overwatch or something, and God's got like all the characters he can put into the game. Or you think of like a movie. He's got movies, and he's got all these characters he can put in. And the way it works is that the contingent part is God can decide which characters go into the movie or the game, or which people go into the world. But each character has all that it's ever going to be already in it. So he doesn't have to put them in, into play. So for example, God could have you know, looked at Trump and said, mm, no. 
uh, in which case there'd be no Chrome. But the trunk piece has all the stuff that, that make up, makes up Chrome. So the, if the trunk piece is on the board, then it's contingent whether Trump exists or not. But if Trump exists, he has to be all the, the Trump he can be. All that stuff that makes up Trump has to be. And the same for all of us. So you didn't have to exist, but given that you do exist, you had to take this class. <laughs> and similarly, I didn't have to exist, but given that I do exist, I have to teach this class. So we get a weird contingent necessity or necessary contingency. So given that you know, Socrates existed, he didn't have to, but since he did, he had to be a philosopher. So the idea is you can deny these truths without a contradiction, because they didn't have to exist. So Socrates didn't have to exist, but if he did, he would have to be a philosopher. So you get this scenario where, kind of weird scenario, where you absolutely must be what you are, but you didn't have to So kind of like uh, going back to maybe a simpler illustration, like with the Billigon. Uh, Billigons have to be a billion sided, but they don't have to exist. God could have said, well, nope, that's too much. You know, I'm going to have any, any of those. I'll just leave those off the, off the board for now. So it's kind of a weird scenario where you don't have any choice. You just are, you know, you just do what you, what you are. And the only choice is on God's part, whether you're in the game or not. I think Levitz also runs into the trouble and he makes it kind of seem like, well, God can't, he couldn't do otherwise because he has to create the best, the best world. So that has to be, he did have to create Trump. And that kind of shows why freedom is you know, kind of a messy, messy concept. So how can we reason about this stuff? Well, going back to our old friend deductive logic, his claim again is that they contain it, again, which is like a metaphor that some people say, yeah, that's that's good. And other people say, well, that's terrible. So if we've got the subject S, he claims it contains all the properties and predicates of it. Again, going back to the example of person, it would be like all that you were, all that you are, all you, what you would be is somehow in there, if you were able to somehow see it. Now, with the truth of fact, he claims no matter how much we analyzed, you know, like Trump, or analyzed ourselves, we wouldn't be able to see that. So for example, if you're wondering what, what will be the lottery numbers you know, tomorrow? So you, you see yourself like buying a ticket, what are the numbers on it? What do you see yourself seeing on, on TV for the, the numbers announced? According to Lodmich, you sadly could not do that because you, you couldn't sit down and analyze yourself and see all your experiences. Which in one way I guess is bad because you can't get the lottery numbers. But another way is kind of good because otherwise you just know everything that's going to happen. But then you also couldn't do anything about it. It should be like, it's like, uh oh. <laughs> so he claims that in those cases we just can't do that. Now, one of the problems comes up is kind of like this seems to be more a problem of not that they're not there, but we just can't, you know, we just can't do it. And it's beyond our, our ability. So what about God? Well, God can do that. So God can comprehend the infinite all at once. And he can see, basically, a priori of the truths of that. Now, so we end up with this kind of weird dichotomy. It's that a part of our truths for us are set by our, our limits. Mm -hmm. And contingent truths are, are contingent because we don't, <laughs> we don't know in a way. But the weird thing is, you know, then this makes it kind of mucky, is that God knows 
the truth, the fact, for everything, a priori. He doesn't have to wait for them to, to happen. So, for example, before God, before in the beginning, God already knew Alexander the Great how he would die. He knew, you know, before, uh, you know, as soon as the world was created, or even before, he knew Trump would be president. So everything that's going to happen, he knows. And of course, this is um, kind of a requirement in Christianity that God has to know everything, to be all knowing. So we end up here because of Leibniz doing this, we end up kind of with a more mushy distinction. And here's one God, again, knows like everything. Because for him, the identity of each thing, each person, this is all, all its properties. So, like me, I would equal every quality of me, everything I do, everything I will be, everything I was, uh, everything I am, that would be me, all this stuff. Now, of course, in my own case, um, I don't know all of this. <laughs> and I definitely don't know the, the future. What is to be, but all of that, even future. So in a way, you are your future, too. However much that would be. So it's kind of a weird scenario where your identity depends not just on the past and the present, but also the future, literally everything. So for us, with truths of reason, basically, according to Leibniz, they're simple enough that even a caveman. Even humans can can do it, so we can we have the epistemic horsepower to be able to, you know, get a clear idea, and you know, deduce the the predicate from the subject. It's within our epistemic limits. Truths of fact, we can't do that because it's beyond our ability. I mean, one obvious thing would be, can we see the future? Sadly, or perhaps goodly, um, no. And we can't see all of the hidden, hidden stuff. So essentially, the distinction then becomes, uh, again, kind of mushy. It's not so much that truths of reason are necessary, a priori, blah, blah, blah. It's that truths of reason for us are ones that we know a priori and are within the, the limited set of things we can, we can do. Truths of fact. Uh, we don't have a clear idea of the nature and can't do this, but God totally can. And this is yet another example of how, like, if you bring God into the picture, that kind of creates a problem. So you always got to account for God. So God's got to be able to know everything, so you end up having to do this kind of stuff. So for Leibniz, um, in terms of freedom, are you free? His answer is yes, no. <laughs> and here's why. He gives kind of a clever answer. So you, again, are everything you were, well, everything you were, everything you are, everything you will be, which means that there's no way you don't do this. So <coughs> if on um, April 14th that 11.52 p.m., you order a burrito <laughs> with extra guacamole, that's already there, that's already in there. Like, and God knows that. It's like, you know, he looks at your DVD, or, and it's like, yep, it's gonna happen. So you can't do otherwise. So, for a lot of this view, we're not free. Now, we don't know this stuff because of our epistemic limitations. So we feel now, Leibniz says we are free, though, for the following reason. God doesn't control us like a puppet. He doesn't, like, make us do stuff. He's not saying there's control or driving us around. So everything we do, we do because of what we are. So you get that burrito with extra guacamole because you deserve it, <laughs> and you like guacamole. Or maybe you don't. Whatever. So you're not being fooled. God's not, like, controlling. He's not, like, doesn't like, he's not, like, God suddenly takes you over and says, guacamole, double it. You're, you're deciding that because you are what you are. And what you are is ordering that guacamole. So we're free because we're not puppets. But then again, we're kind of not free because God creates us so that you do get that guacamole. So even though he's not 
controlling you like a puppet, we're like, a, we're like drones. You know, like we have a pre-programmed mission and we do our mission. And then we, you know, then we're done. So our whole mission is already in there. And we, we play it out. And God, of course, creates us, so he knows the whole mission. He knows that on this day, their mission is block, double block of holy. Uh, but we don't know that. But again, he's not directly controlling us. He just created us, so we'll, we'll do all that stuff. So we're free, but not. Or not free, but free, depending on uh, which way you want it to go. Now, one interesting thing is, of course, that maybe, since it's all in there, maybe there could be cases where you do get to peek ahead. So one interesting thing is, like, notions of prophecy or deja vu, is that, interestingly, Leibniz does allow for that to occur because all that you are, in a sense, is already in there. And your present moment, again, is kind of like the, like the needle on the record or you know, the, the, the play point of the YouTube video. And if you could somehow, like, well, it's like I could do on like a video. You could you know, skip ahead and you know, peek ahead. So if you could like, skip ahead and see the future, it's in a way already there. So notions of like prophecy and precognition actually does work with Leibniz because it's already all there. So if you if you still look at the paper topic, one interesting one could be like Leibniz and knowing the future, or you know prophecies and precognition. Because given his view, if everything already are is in there, maybe you might somehow have some way of you know peeking ahead and seeing your your future. Okay, before pressing on to our good dead friend Immanuel Kant, anything about Leibniz or the future? He needs more stuff. Okay, our good dead friend Immanuel Kant, he was a guy, <laughs> did a lot of stuff, um, had some interesting personality traits. He didn't travel much. I think the most he went was like 50 miles from his house, but he knew a lot about the world. Of course, back then, you know, no planes or trains or automobiles, so mm -hmm. if you want to travel, it's like horse or boat or, or walking. He also was uh, very orderly. He would go on his walk every day, and he could still go to Konigsberg, where Kant was doing his conting, and walk the philosopher's walk. There's actually a Kant festival at there every year. One, according to one story, one day he uh, didn't show up for his walk, and he, he was so punctual about his walks, the locals would set their timepieces by him. And they were worried, they ran to his house and found that he, he said he got so interested in his book he was reading, he forgot to take his walk. But he promised them he'd never do that again. So he always went back on his regular walking schedule. He contributed a lot to philosophy, um, areas of metaphysics, epistemology, etc. Also in other areas of science as well. And then of course he died, and he's still dead today. Now, Kant came in pretty much like after, obviously after Leibniz and Locke and Hume, and kind of his motivating backstory is a combination of Leibniz, because you know, he was that was kind of what he what he learned, and then then later he read David Hume, and he said that Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers, and but a professor said you know, that we can be dogmatic when he was awake, but which is philosophical. Philosophers should never quit their day jobs. <laughs> Except for Steve Martin, philosophy major. So he, he was trained in Leibnizian rationalism and then read Hume and said, hmm, both of these are wrong. <laughs> but interesting things about them. So what was he trying to do? Well, much like all the folks he looked at, you know, Descartes and and so forth, and law, similar type of thing. He was, came after these guys, but like Descartes, he, Hume and Locke, he said, oh, you know, sciences and philosophy, you get all the stuff, but it's a mess. So we really need to clear that mess up. And of course, you know, people have been trying to clear that up for a long time. So goal number one, clarify the foundations of science. Now, from Leibniz, he got all that, you know, a priori stuff and necessity stuff and all that stuff, so that's kind of in there. 
but he also read Hume with all the you know you can't know stuff. It's all you know it's all empirical, and so he kind of combined them into an unholy beast. <laughs> Second group, much like um, the previous folks, he wanted to resolve the conflict between science, religion, morality, and freedom. So again, the same same project that all the other you know Locke, Descartes, and Leibniz tried to work on. And third goal. Metaphysics was in a crisis at this point, and he wanted to resolve that, that crisis. So that was kind of it. The, essentially, the previous dead guys trying to do this <laughs> created a mess. So now we've got three messes to clean up by trying to clean up. It's kind of like you're trying to clean up the first two, and they pour bleach all over everything. It's like, oh, now we have bleach all over everything. So now we've got mess, mess, and bleach over there. We've got to mop that stuff up. I'm going to believe they're just making it worse. So. Now, Kant wrote big, unreadable books, but not the biggest or most unreadable books. Um, not the biggest, because Tolstoy, I think, wrote one of the biggest, and not the most unreadable, because the other uh, German philosophers, Heidegger and Hegel, Hegel wrote unreadable books. Um, I tried to read them, <laughs> but uh, I got better eventually. Someone's going to read them. Fortunately, not me. Now, what is Kant famous for? Well, lots of stuff. One of his claims to fame by people who like Kant is his Copernican revolution philosophy. Copernicus, of course, is credited, perhaps incorrectly, because all history is a lie, with, we don't know, we are there. It could all be a lie. He's carried with the idea that the, there was a geocentric view, which was the Earth was the center of the universe, and the sun revolved around, everything revolved around the Earth. Which wasn't a stupid idea, because if, you know, the sun seems to move around the Earth, and at night, you know, stars and moon and stuff seem to move around the Earth. So, not a stupid idea. Now, through uh, the power of math and observations, Copernicus is credited with the idea that it's not the sun revolving around the Earth, it's the Earth <laughs> revolving around the sun, going from geocentric to heliocentric. And of course, that, as they say, changed everything. Well, it didn't really change everything, because nothing changes everything, because you know, ice, cream, ice cream is still delicious, and two plus two is still four, so it doesn't change. But it was a radical change. Now, Kant is seen as doing a similar type of thing in philosophy. How so? Well, here was the, um, the problem, or rather the previous solution. The empiricists in the past had to take the view that we saw, we talked about uh, representational realism. So the idea was that you have objects out there, <laughs> people experience it through their senses, they get the idea. So the claim was that knowledge, you know, our idea of the object corresponds to the object. What's in here matches what's out there. But as we saw, every effort to answer the question, well, how do we know what's out there, a priori, like what Descartes tried to do, those all fail. Hume was a guy who, when he looked at the um, skepticism regarding the senses, Hume goes through that and says, you know, I thought we could trust the senses, and the Zen result is basically, I'm just going to go drink more beer. I can't, I can't solve this. Only beer can solve this problem. So he agrees with Hume that given the system of empiricism, the old skeptical problem can't be beat because it's, you can never get outside of your mind and see your idea of your object, because all you've got is <laughs> just another idea. So imagining this doesn't solve the problem. Because then the question is, you know, this is now in the mind, does is this correct? And then you just keep on drawing little little people <laughs> you know, just keep keep drawing bigger and bigger circles. 
you know, little people imagining you just keep drawing. Of course, that's not, we're just going to keep drawing circles and little people. Which is not the worst way to spend the day. Now, Khan has a fix for this. He says, yeah, this is never going to work. You're never going to be able to get this correspondence, that this matches this. So what's his fix? Well, he flips it around. He claims that it's not going this way, that our knowledge corresponds to the object. His claim is, is that the objects correspond to our knowledge. He flips it around. So roughly speaking, instead of you know the object uh, us orbiting the objects, the objects orbit us. So how does that work? Well, his claim is this: we get the he does agree with empiricists. We get like sense data coming in. So you have like experience data flowing in. Then what has to happen is the mind has to structure or order that stuff coming in. So, in recent stuff, in a way, kind of seems to support it. I gave the example of there were people who uh, were blind, born blind, and then they did uh, operations on them so they could see, and it's sort of part of the process, they said, hey, this is a great chance to you know, do or test all these, these theories about stuff. And so one of the things they, they did was they showed someone like a picture of a cop. Is a cow with, um, you know, multicolored cow, and they ask the person like, "What is the, you know, what is the object?" And you draw the lines around it. And what they did is instead of just you know saying, "Oh, this is a cow," they they split it up into multiple objects based on the, the color because they had, they had yet to have the concept of you know, cow as a single thing. Mm -hmm. Now, to us, of course, we we learn what cows are, so we we would just say cow. But if they're just seeing for the first time, it does make sense for them to divide it up based on you know, different color, that is, color patches. So what Khan thinks is, is that we've got our structure ordering, going back to the example of the, the cow, that we have stuff built in. And then what we do is, we organize and structure our experience with that, that structure. Going back to my usual metaphor, it's like the you know, filter uh, on you know, your camera. When you take pictures, it's already putting a filter on it. It's, it's the no filter filter. But it's you know, <laughs> essentially ordering and structuring that. So his claim is, what we do basically is this. We have the data comes in raw data, you know, just whatever it is that's popping into our mind. And what our mind does is it structures and orders that. And we don't even realize we're doing this. We do it automatically. We just we don't have to like sit there and wait to you know load in, load in classes and it's just automatic. Now sometimes in a way we, we can kind of get a feel that we are kind of processing stuff because you probably at times you're looking at something and you can't quite tell what it is because like the lighting's off, the angle's off and you're trying to sort out, like, what is that exactly? And then you, you need a way you can kind of feel the processing going on because you can't, you can't process it. But most of the time, we just do it instantly, just, you know, as soon as it comes in. So he claims is, this gives us knowledge of the objects a priori. And so, well, if our intuition must conform to the object, then we can't know anything about the objects say for all because we can't break that. We don't know like, what's going on. But if the object in our, in our mind must conform to our faculty of intuition, then we can know stuff a priori. So what does that mean? How does that work? Well, the basic idea going on there, again, in the picture, is that old view, object out here, goes in here, idea of the object. 
But then again, the problem is you can't get out of your mind, so you can't know what this is. Con's view is that, yeah, something goes in, you get something coming in, but the mind organizes and structures it, and so you can know this because the way the stuff coming in is structured and ordered is already in the mind. It doesn't come from the outside. So you don't have to go outside of your mind to know that because it is in your mind, structuring and ordering. Again, going back to the example of the, the phone, it'd be like you have access to like filters, so you know what the filters are, you don't know what's out there, but you know what the filters do. So the filters, you know, stuff comes in, the filter is applied to it, so you can know the filter without experience, because the filter, the filter is already sorting your experience. So close. Now then, kind of the obvious question at this point is, um, what's out there? Yeah, because the, the problem with the external world is, how do we know what's in here matches what's out there? And Khan says, oh, I, I saw this. Um, what's in here is structured by your, you know, this, by the mind. So then, are we just like creating stuff on nothing? Well, this is his claim. He claims we don't create reality. So he's not a phenomenologist. So it's not that we're making up a world in our mind and living in that world. But the way reality appears depends on two things. One, the senses, stuff coming in, and our mind, what it, it does with it. And of course we don't know, we're not aware of this. We just already, you know, and again as I noted, one way we can kind of see that it is a process is when we're trying to figure out like what something is. Or like with the, remember the blue dress, was it blue dress, gold dress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where people, or like, was it the yow, or there's a sound one too, I can't remember the two. Oh, yeah, I can't yeah. sound. Yeah, so, so clearly we're processing it, uh, because we're, and you can kind of like, listening to it, you can kind of like, sometimes change your mind, because mm -hmm. you're listening to it different ways. So when we're, when we're confronted with something kind of complicated, we kind of realize, yeah, we are actually, we are actually doing interpretation. And most of the time we don't, we just, just automatic, except for those problem cases. So, the experience we have is a combination. First, there's whatever it is our senses produce in our mind. So, you know, whatever that is. <laughs> then, there is the structure our mind imposes upon it, what we, the way we process that. So for example, when we're looking around, and one example we look at this and we, we process that as a backpack. So we have the data flying in, but we get these concepts of how it's divided up as backpacks. Now, as the skeptic said, we can never compare reality as it you know, appears to reality as it is before we structure. So we never get the, the raw data. To use, um, I guess, an example or analogy, it's kind of like, um, well, you can think of like uh, cameras that can, that can detect wavelengths that we can't. So the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum is actually pretty big, and we can only see a small part of the visible light. But we know there's infrared, which we can't see. We can feel it, though. It's, we feel it as heat. We, we actually do have infrared sensors. We feel warm. There's also, also ultraviolet, which most of us can't see, uh, but these can see. And then, of course, there's also x-rays and, and so on, which we can see the results of them. We can we use them to get images, but we can't see x-rays. And then, of course, you have radio waves, et cetera. And in theory, it's not that like light is anything magical. It's just our sensors detect that range. And you with modifications, we could see more. You know, there are creatures that do, that you know, just naturally see you know, deeper into the infrared or into the ultraviolet. And so what we do is we see this stuff, and the other stuff we don't, 
we don't see. But all that stuff is still like coming at us. And right now, we're, there's radio waves and stuff just blasting all through us. We just can't detect them, which in a way would be good, because otherwise we just go nuts because there's so much. I mean, imagine if you could pick up Wi-Fi and radio and TV. Uh, I guess it'd be handy to be in a selector, but it was just all blasted in. Yeah, and so we get this, and then we process it. Now, we can, of course, take things we, we can't see and then process them so we can see them. For example, we can't see infrared, but if you ever seen like, you know, movies where they show like infrared images, that's not what it really looks like. They just translated something that we can see to, to colors. So we we process that. So taking something, you know, we don't know what it really looks like because we can we can't see it, but we process it into something we can see. So what is it really like? It just we just have the conversion. Same with like x-rays, we can't see x-rays, what does it really look like, we don't know. But we do the image and we process it so we can see the x-ray. We don't really see x-rays, we're seeing just the picture from the x-rays. And so our mind is you know, doing that filtering for us. So we've got whatever's coming in and then we process it into what we got. So it's like, <laughs> there's whatever this is and then we process it into something. Use an analogy. It's like a factory where, like, raw materials coming in, and they process it into, you know, like meats come in, and they process it into hot dog. <laughs> so basically, our, our, what we're experiencing is hot dog, and we never see whatever what, what's coming in. We just see the hot dog, which is probably for the best. Now, a good question would be then: Isn't this all just relativism? Because if our minds are just, you know. Again, like stuff comes in, you can think of, think of it like, like a blob of play notes. But the four, you can, oh, yeah, you can use kind of a metaphor. It's kind of like, you can imagine your, your mind is like a, it's like you're the king or the queen sitting on your throne, and then you have stuff, you know, comes in for an audience, and you have like your ministers there, and something just kind of plops in on the floor, and they're like, oh, this will never do, and you like dress it, dress it up, you know, appropriately for the audience and they bring it in for you to see, you never see what plops through the door. It's, it's unfit for your royal eyes. You get something that's already been dressed up appropriately. So that's what we, what we see, or whatever plopped in appropriately. So stuff's coming in naked, and you're, you're like, the person's like, no, no nakedness, <laughs> put on some pants. So why then isn't it all relative? You know, why isn't, you know, because if the things we're getting in here are just all dressed up, just from our own, you know, minds, why isn't it all relative? Well, Khan is kind of a clever answer, or trick. If all our minds have the same basic structure, then we would have objective universal knowledge in kind of a way that's either a cheat or brilliant, or brilliant. because, yeah, all that this, the stuff you have in your mind, the stuff I have in my mind, it's all like, going back to metaphor, it's dressed up by our you know, door person. They, they clean it up and clothe it and send it through the door for us to see. And so, yeah, we never see what's really out there. But his claim is, essentially, that we all have the same basic door person and the same basic wardrobe. So everything that comes in, <coughs> I never see your use, <coughs> you never see mine, but we all have the same, you know, we're all buying from the same, you know, clothier. So we all have, you know, Calvin Klein or whatever in there. So whatever comes in gets dressed the same, same way. So he claims that's where you get the obje objectivity. I mean, to use kind of a metaphor, uh, color, you know, even people in a Kantian say color is not in the world, but we all agree that you know, the color of the shirt, because even though it's not out there, we all have the same like color clothing. So when it comes in, you know, we say that's shirt is black, you know, paint's gray, you know, it's white, it's white. And so even though it's not really out there, we all have the same stuff in here. So it's objective in a sense. Before pressing on, anything about that? Or clothing choices. <laughs> it's more stuff. Now we saw with Kant, kind of his, one of his many contributions, at least people in the paper talk about Kant claim, 
is that um, analytic-synthetic distinction was civically being the synthetic um, a priori. And that was kind of his deal, because here's sort of his motivation. He reads Hume, and Hume says basically, you know, you can't trust the senses, you can't have any knowledge of personal identity, you can't have any knowledge of causation, you can't know anything about it. <laughs> Everything, you know, so you can't know any of this stuff. And Kant realizes that if this were the case, then we would have pretty much almost no knowledge, because you couldn't know any of this stuff. So kind of his goal is to get the synthetic a priori, so you can know stuff about the world, but be sure about it. So he's trying to, you know, basically solve the problems created by, by Hume. So here's his distinctions. And the analytic synthetic, uh, again, we've seen this before, but it's always kind of basically the, the same kind of thing. Analytic judgments are like Leibniz's truth of reason. They're based on that principle of consciousness. So if you have a true analytical judgment to deny it, then it will be necessarily false. Again, if we say triangles have three sides, if you deny that, that the three-side thing doesn't have three sides, then there would be a contradiction. And again, there's the metaphor of contained. The predicate is contained within the subject. Also, the judgment being true is independent of facts. And they don't give you any new knowledge about the world. So knowing that triangles are three-sided doesn't tell you anything new. Again, going back to my you know, sci-fi story, if you're traveling about to your dimension, you know, you don't have to look, you know, before you open the door, you don't have to say, I wonder if triangles three still have three sides here. Yeah, you don't have to check. They don't, they don't, it doesn't tell you anything new. Synthetic judgments give us knowledge about the world. So, for example, that would be like knowing if the atmosphere there is breathable. Is there air? <laughs> Hopefully so. And why do they call it synthetic? Well, the analytic ones are called analytic because you analyze the subject. And again, this is a metaphor because we, we get what it's like to analyze, say something chemically, like analyze you know, the contents of food or water or a sample. But analyzing, you know, judgments, uh, you know, statements, that seems metaphorical. Synthetic, what we do is, again, metaphorically, is to synthesize the subject with a predicate. And again, this is a metaphor. We, we know what it is to synthesize something, like, to manufacture something, like synthetic, you know, gasoline or synthetic, you know, plastics. Or actually, you know, but this is but a metaphor. So if you deny a true synthetic judgment, you don't get a contradiction. So for example, if you say you know Trump is not president, that would that is probably still false. Who knows what's happened? You know, things change fast. But we can't tell, you know, sitting here, we, we couldn't analyze Trump as president and see if he still is president or not. We have to then fill the check if he's still president. Or similarly, like it's like I say, like when someone's dead or not, it's a philosopher. You just can't analyze like their name and see if they're alive or dead. You gotta like check. So so far, you know, the usual usual stuff. Now, you know, we'll close with this. So for Kant, what the next thing we'll go to is again his objective is to get to this synthetic a a um, a priori. That's his dream. And so we'll work through the various things next time to see how we can know the things. So have a good rest of the day. And I'm going to check to see if Trump's <laughs> And uh, see you on Tuesday.